Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's Senate Occasional Lecture. In welcoming you, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and pay respect to all Indigenous elders, past and present. Today, it's a very great pleasure for me to welcome a colleague, Phil Bowen, PSM, FCPA, the inaugural Parliamentary Budget Office. Uh, the Parliamentary Budget <laughs> Office itself was um, you could probably say it's the first new part of the parliamentary administration since Federation. We started out with five departments, consolidated into three a little while ago, and um, as a result of the um, agreements for better parliament during the 43rd parliament, the parliamentary budget office was part of that agreement and it was brought into being by legislation. So it's the first new parliamentary administration unit since Federation. It performs a very important task and uh, Phil's going to introduce that range of, of uh, roles to us today and, and probably talk a bit about its origins and, uh, and its future directions as well. Um, as I mentioned, Phil's the inaugural parliamentary budget officer. He's had a long career in public sector uh, areas, including our friends, the Department of Finance. Uh, he, but he came back to Australia to head the parliamentary budget office from the Asian Development Bank. Um, and he's had new, held numerous senior positions across the, the public sector in a, in a long and distinguished career. So, to talk about the Parliamentary Budget Office supporting Australian democracy, I'd like you all to welcome Phil Bowen. Thank you, Rosemary. Uh, I'm not sure whether your emphasis was on long or distinguished, but I'll accept both. Um, and good afternoon, uh, everybody. It's nice to see you all here uh, for this lecture. Uh, Rosemary, thank you for inviting me to present the lecture today. Um, and let me start <coughs> by acknowledging the traditional owners uh, on whose lands we meet and paying my respects to elders past and present. Now, for those of you who have come uh, expecting or hoping for me to drop some political bombshells, uh, I'm afraid you will be disappointed I won't take offence if you want to leave now, but if you stay, <clears throat> you will get some glimpses of the journey that uh, we in the Parliamentary Budget Office have been on over the past uh, three years or so. So <clears throat> the establishment of the Parliamentary Budget Office, or as I will call it, the PBO, arguably represents the most significant institutional initiative to enhance the Commonwealth's fiscal responsibility framework since the passage of the landmark Charter of Budget Honesty Act. I thought for a minute Rosemary was going to steal all of my thunder. Uh, she didn't quite, but she did uh, alert me to a piece of information that I wasn't aware of and that we are the first element of parliamentary, uh, of the parliamentary institution since uh, Federation. Uh, I'll use that in future speeches, Rosemary, but um, <clears throat> the focus of my lecture today is on the role that the PBO plays in supporting our democratic processes. Now, I know many, many institutions support the democratic processes. I'm not singling out the PBO as being the only supporter, but we do play an important role. So I'll briefly cover <coughs> the background to the establishment of the PBO, its mandate, how we operate, how we're resourced, and I will also outline the work that the PBO has undertaken since it was established a little over three years ago and reflect on the PBO's evolution as a credible, trusted, independent and non-partisan institution of our peak democratic body, the Australian Parliament.
For our democratic processes to work effectively, it is essential that our parliamentarians, whether in government or not, are well informed about the policy choices that they are required to make. Similarly, a well-informed public is a prerequisite for a well-functioning democracy. The PBO contributes to this process by providing the parliament and the general public with information about the budget and fiscal policy settings, crucial information for making sound policy choices. So let me talk a little bit about the establishment of the PBO. <clears throat> The PBO is one of a growing number, and I should say rapidly growing number, of independent fiscal institutions that are being established around the world. Approximately 30 member countries of the OECD have established such institutions. Most have been established since the 2008 global financial crisis as has the PBO, although I should add quickly that it wasn't established because of the global financial crisis. Others have been. A few of these organisations have existed for many years, such as the Congressional Budget Office in the United States, which has been operating since 1975 and is a good role model for newer institutions, including our own. The resource bases and mandates of these institutions differ depending on the political systems in which they operate. <clears throat> but they all share a common goal of enhancing fiscal discipline and promoting greater budget transparency and accountability. The concept of an Australian PBO dates back several years. In his budget in reply speech in May 2009, the then leader of the coalition, who just happens to be our current Prime Minister, said that honesty in fiscal policy would be served by the creation of an Australian version of America's Congressional Budget Office. Subsequently, <clears throat> as Rosemary alluded to, a commitment to establish a PBO formed part of an agreement negotiated between political parties and independent members of parliament after the 2010 federal election. A joint select committee, a parliamentary committee was set up to inquire into the proposed establishment of a PBO. Reporting in March 2011, the committee unanimously supported the PBO's establishment. The legislation establishing the PBO as an independent and non-partisan parliamentary department was passed in December of that year, 2011. My appointment as the inaugural Parliamentary Budget Officer for a term of four years from 23 July 2012, so you can do your sums, was announced on the 30th of May 2012. Let's look at the mandate that we have in the PBO. The Parliamentary Service Act states that the purpose of the Parliamentary Budget Office is to inform the Parliament by providing independent and non-partisan analysis of the budget cycle, fiscal policy and the financial implications of proposals. <clears throat> when introducing the legislation establishing the PBO, the then Treasurer said that the PBO would enhance the credibility and transparency of Australia's already strong fiscal and budget frameworks, promote greater understanding in the community about the budget and fiscal policy, and ensure that the Australian public can be better informed 
about the budget impacts of policies proposed by members of parliament. These aspirations translate into two broad objectives for the PBO. First, to help level the playing field for all parliamentarians in their access to policy costings and budget analyses. And second, <clears throat> to enhance the transparency and public understanding of the budget and fiscal policy settings. The PBO seeks to help level the political playing field by preparing policy costings and budget analyses for any parliamentarian who requests such work to be undertaken. Policy costings may be prepared on a confidential basis in response to requests made outside of the caretaker period for a general election. Responses to policy costings <coughs> requested during the caretaker period must be made public. Budget analyses that do not include policy costings may be prepared on a confidential basis at any time. And the PBO is required to publish any policy costings or budget analyses that have not been prepared on a confidential basis. If you're confused by all of that, you can read it in the document when you pick it up on your way out. Uh, but the differences are important. <clears throat> Transparency and public understanding of the budget and fiscal policy settings are promoted by the PBO through our self-initiated program of published research. The PBO is able also to make submissions to parliamentary committees and when we do, such submissions must be made public. In its work, <clears throat> the PBO is required to use the most recent official budget estimates as a baseline, along with the official underlying economic forecasts and parameters. And within 30 days after the end of the caretaker period for a general election, the PBO is required to prepare a report on the budgetary implications of the election commitments of the major parliament, uh, parliamentary parties. The then Treasurer, <clears throat> when introducing the amending legislation for this reporting requirement, said the bill will impose discipline on the promises of political parties and incentivise all political parties to be upfront and honest about the cost of their promises. The Parliamentary Budget Officer <coughs> is an independent statutory officer of the Australian Parliament and is not subject to direction in the performance of his or her statutory functions. The independence and non-partisanship of the PBO are essential characteristics that give parliamentarians the necessary confidence to interact with the PBO, often on a highly confidential basis, as they formulate their policy proposals. These characteristics also enable the PBO to publish analyses of the budget and fiscal policy settings unconstrained by external influences. To preserve its non-partisan status, the PBO does not provide policy advice, nor does it make policy recommendations. And that's quite important. With independence, of course, the requirement for accountability becomes more important than ever. The Parliamentary Budget Officer is accountable to the presiding officers of the Parliament, that is the President of the Senate and the Speaker of the House of Representatives, for the management of the PBO and is accountable to the Parliament for the performance of his or her functions. The PBO has a special relationship with the Joint Committee of Public Accounts and Audit, the JCPAA. 
The PBA must consult with the JCPAA in the preparation of its annual work plan, which if you're interested, you can find on our website. The JCPAA <clears throat> also considers the PBO's annual budget estimates and other aspects of the PBO's operations. After each general election, the committee may call for an independent review of the PBO's operations. After the 2013 general election, the then Auditor General, uh, Ian McPhee, who is in the audience, uh, conducted a performance audit of the administration of the PBO. This report was tabled in June 2014 and was accepted by the JCPAA as an independent review of the PBO for the purposes of the committee. Subsequently, as is common practice, the JCPAA conducted its own review of the PBO's operations based on the Auditor General's performance audit. <clears throat> the JCPAA reported to the Parliament in November of 2014, making a number of recommendations to support the PBO's operations. Uh, the government responded to the JCPAA in June of this year, noting and or supporting the committee's recommendations, with the exception of the recommendation that the PBO should have access to the details of the, the confidential contingency reserve in the budget. So <clears throat> the PBO's costings remain subject to the caveat that we do not have access to the details of the contingency reserve. Talk a little bit about access to information and the importance of confidentiality of the information that we receive. Access to information, <coughs> including financial models, in a timely fashion is vital for the PBO to be able to prepare high quality responses to requests from parliamentarians within reasonable time frames and to undertake research and analysis on the budget uh, and fiscal policy settings. The PBO does not have a statutory power to demand information, but it is able to enter into cooperative arrangements with Commonwealth agencies for access to information. To this end, <clears throat> very soon after the PBO commenced operations, I signed a memorandum of understanding with the heads of Commonwealth departments and major agencies for the provision of information to the PBO. The MOU has a pro-disclosure bias and ensures that the PBO has access at a minimum to the same level of information that would be available under the Freedom of Information Act. We have since also put in place arrangements with some departments, <coughs> pardon me, for the regular provision of information uh, to the PBO after each economic and fiscal update with a view to reducing the administrative burden for departments and the PBO. In addition, <clears throat> the Taxation Administration Act was amended to give the PBO the same access as the Treasury to confidential de-identified taxpayer unit record data to use in the costing of taxation proposals. Our ability to engage with parliamentarians on a confidential basis is central to the effectiveness of our role in providing them with confidential policy costings uh, and budget analyses for use at their discretion. <clears throat> Confidentiality of dealings with the PBO is protected by the PBO's exemption from the provisions of the, the FOI Act. All documents relating to the PBO requests that are in the hands of other Commonwealth agencies are also exempt from public disclosure. <clears throat> In 
In addition, government protocols are in place requiring ministers not to ask about and Commonwealth agency, agency heads not to disclose details of their specific dealings with uh, the PBO. Our experience to date is that these uh, cooperative arrangements with agencies are working well <clears throat> and in general we are receiving the information that we need to undertake our work. <clears throat> Excuse me one second. <clears throat> <clears throat> so, um, looking at the resourcing of the, of the office, um, the PBO is a small, vibrant office, quite a number of them are here today, of around 40 staff. Every staff member who joins the PBO brings a professional skill. Our analysts have strong quantitative skills and are highly experienced in economic, financial and fiscal policy analysis. Staff are deployed on a flexible basis as operational needs dictate. Nominally, approximately two thirds of the staff are allocated to the preparation of policy costings and budget analyses. <clears throat> A quarter of the staff are responsible for our published research program and a small core, uh, but a very good core, manage our corporate service delivery and compliance functions. The office has an annual budget of approximately $7 million with additional funding provided every third year to help meet the demands associated with the general election. Uh, the PBO also has access to a special appropriation which currently has a balance of uh, 5.3 million. It had a balance of 6 million uh, when we started three years ago, so we've been fairly prudent in our use of that uh, special appropriation. <clears throat> Monday the 23rd of July, 2012 will be forever etched on my memory. Returning to Australia the previous Friday from having worked overseas for more than five years, I found myself in Parliament House with one temporary staff member occupying a borrowed Senator's suite uh, with the task of establishing a new parliamentary department. <clears throat> The immediate challenge was to build sufficient capability to respond effectively to requests from parliamentarians as quickly as possible. Some six weeks later, in early September 2012, with only a basic capability in place and around a dozen temporary staff, we opened our doors uh, for business. Parliamentarians immediately took up the opportunity to submit requests for policy costings and budget analyses. By the end of the first year of operations, and I mean the first financial year, 2012-13, <clears throat> we had responded to more than 660 requests. Clearly, there was a pent up demand for the PBO's services, in particular from non-government parliamentarians uh, and at that time, the, uh, particularly from the coalition that was in opposition. The level of demand <coughs> was heightened by the impending 2013 general election. Talk a little bit about the 2013 general election. We faced a consistently high demand for policy costings and analyses in the lead up to the election. In the 10 week period from the beginning of July 2013 to polling day, which was the 7th of September 2013, <clears throat> we responded to more than 1,100 requests with no fully specified requests remaining incomplete. 
It was quite a feat. <clears throat> the greater majority of the policy costings completed in the lead up to the election were prepared on a confidential basis. This was because <clears throat> most requests were submitted as confidential requests prior to the caretaker period uh, commencing, including in the very short window of opportunity between the release of the then government's economic statement and the start of the caretaker period, a short window of two or three days from memory. <clears throat> very few publicly released policies were submitted to the PBO for costing and public release during the caretaker period. We published the 2013 post-election report uh, of election commitments on the 18th of October, uh, just within the 30-day period following the end of the caretaker period. It included an assessment of the budgetary impacts of the election commitments made by each of the main parliamentary parties, namely the Labor, Australian Labor Party, the Coalition and the Australian Greens. The report confirmed <coughs> that the budget impacts of the election commitments made by each party were generally consistent with the costs of the policies made public by the parties prior to the election. This was hardly surprising since the majority or the greater majority of these policies had already been costed by the PBO prior to the polling day. Let's look in a little more detail at, at what we mean by policy costings and budget analyses and how we go about this. <clears throat> the demand from parliamentarians for policy costings and budget analyses uh, hasn't slowed, it has continued unabated. Over the course of our first three years of operation, we received almost 3,200 requests for policy costings and budget analyses, and we provided more than 3,000 responses. Already <clears throat> in the first quarter of 2015-16, which ends uh, on the 30th of this month, we have responded to more than 300 requests. And there is little doubt that this level of demand will be maintained in the run up to the next election. The costings we prepare <coughs> cover a wide range of policy proposals. Various taxation and social transfer payment programs feature prominently because of their substantial budget impacts. A PBO costing, <coughs> it's important to understand, is not simply a set of figures. Each costing document also spells out the key specifications of the policy proposal, our assumptions, including assumed behavioural responses to the policy proposal, the data sources used, the methodology employed, and the costings reliability rating. <clears throat> I'm happy to answer questions on these aspects later. All costings cover the budget and three forward estimates years. Many include 10-year projections, either at the request of parliamentarians or where the budget impact of a policy proposal differs markedly beyond the Ford Estimates period. And we quite often see <coughs> policies introduced which either have start dates late in the Ford Estimates period or they have relatively smaller amounts of expenditure during the Ford Estimates and quite larger amounts in later years and that's what we seek to pick up in our costings. <clears throat> Increasingly, we are also being requested to include the distributional impacts of policy proposals on different socio-economic groups. 
Prior to the establishment of the PBO, parliamentary parties with fewer than five members and independent parliamentarians had no access to publicly funded policy costing and budget analysis services. Non-government parties with five or more members could submit policies to the Treasury and the Department of Finance for costing under the then provisions of the Charter of Budget Honesty. The Charter required <clears throat> that only publicly announced policies could be costed and then only during the caretaker period with the costings to be made public, either by the Treasury or the Department of Finance, depending on which department had prepared the costings. In practice, this meant that non-government parties could have access to publicly funded policy costing services for only approximately four to six weeks in the total electoral cycle of three years. They had no access to these services on a confidential basis as they developed their policy platforms. You could hardly say in those circumstances that there was a level playing field. Since the establishment of the PBO, all parliamentarians have had access to publicly funded policy costing and budget analysis services over the entire course of the three-year electoral cycle. A very different situation. This means <clears throat> that now, outside of the caretaker period, parliamentarians can deal confidentially with the PBO and use the process in an interactive and measured fashion to help develop more robust policies that have been properly costed before they are publicly announced. Parliamentary parties and independent parliamentarians are no longer bound to run the gauntlet of the Charter of Budget Honesty Costing process with the publicly announced policies that have not been professionally costed in advance of their public release. In the past, <clears throat> there have been examples of policies that have been publicly announced with costings that, when reviewed by the Treasury and or the Department of Finance uh, under the Charter costing arrangements, were found to be materially inaccurate. You may well be able to think of some. Such discrepancies in costings could have a very detrimental effect on the credibility of the policies involved and, in extreme cases, could even damage the election prospects of the political parties concerned. With the PBO now in place and its services being extensively used by parliamentarians, it is much less likely that such undesirable situations will arise in the future. <clears throat> we are able to work in a relatively informal and interactive manner with parliamentarians, and this is quite important. For instance, we encourage parliamentarians to have informal discussions with us before formally submitting their requests. This helps to ensure that the requests are adequately explained and the necessary supporting material is provided to enable us to undertake our work in a timely fashion. We also engage with parliamentarians during the preparation of our responses. We may initiate discussions to clarify issues or to seek additional information. Parliamentarians too may wish to contact us if they become aware of any additional information that could have a material bearing on the work that they have requested us to undertake. This level of informal, interactive engagement with parliamentarians um, on policy costings and budget analyses was not possible in the past. This is a positive development stemming from the establishment of the PBO that has considerable potential to enhance policy development. 
I'd like to turn now to our published research program. <clears throat> the Australian government's budget documents are very extensive and contain a large amount of information. However, for the uninitiated reader, and I might say at times even for readers familiar with the documents, finding and extracting information can be difficult, to say the least. The PBO has a role to play in making budget information more accessible and understandable by parliamentarians and by the public at large. In undertaking this public education role, it is important that we ensure that our publications are relevant and timely and add value through expert independent analysis that helps to inform public discussion on current fiscal policy issues. They must also be written in plain English, avoiding the use of obscure technical language and jargon to make them meaningful to as wide an audience as possible. <clears throat> the PBO's program of published research has a particular focus on the sustainability of the budget over the medium term. By the medium term, we talk about out about 10 years. Consistent with this focus, <clears throat> our first report, prepared after the 2013-14 budget, examined the structural position of the Australian government's budget, that is, uh, the position of the budget after allowing or discounting for cyclical and one-off factors. We chose this topic because the underlying structure of the budget had been the subject of considerable public debate at that time. And a structural budget balance analysis had not been included in the budget papers since 2009-10. Our report showed <clears throat> that the budget had been in structural deficit for some years and on the basis of the uh, projections as at the 13-14 budget was likely to remain so over the Ford estimates period. We indicated that there would be value in this analysis being undertaken on a regular basis to enable the structural budget balance to be monitored over time. Subsequently, the, Treasury, the secretaries of the Treasury and the Department of Finance included an analysis of the structural budget balance in their 2013 pre-election economic and fiscal outlook report. Structural budget balance analyses have since been included in all budget reports commencing with the 2013-14 mid-year economic and fiscal outlook report. In those circumstances, the PBO is quite happy not to prepare another uh, structural budget balance while uh, these analyses are included in the official budget papers. <clears throat> Our other research reports to date have examined the following. Historical trends in budget receipts and payments at the Commonwealth and national levels, the sensitivity of the budget to economic shocks, and medium-term projections of budget receipts and payments. Our latest medium-term projections report, prepared after the 2015-16 budget, provided detailed projections of budget receipts and payments out to the year 2025-26, based on no change in the government's policy settings over this 10-year projection period. The annual budget papers, the question is why have we chosen to do this? The annual budget papers include detailed four-year estimates of receipts, payments, and the balance sheet position. They also include 10-year projections of the underlying cash balance and net debt. But 
they provide no details of the underpinning projections over the, the 10 years of receipts and payments. On the other hand, every five years, <clears throat> the intergenerational report provides a snapshot of how projected changes in factors such as Australia's population size and age profile may impact economic growth, workforce participation and the sustainability of public finances over the ensuing 40 years. So the PBO, <clears throat> by publishing detailed 10-year projections of receipts and payments, seeks to help fill the information gap between the government's detailed annual four-year forward estimates and its five yearly 40-year fiscal projections. If prepared on a regular basis, detailed 10-year projections could help to throw more light on the major drivers of the budget, identify significant divergent budgetary trends over the medium term, and facilitate early consideration of any necessary fiscal policy adjustments. The forecast improvement in the underlying cash balance over the 2015-16 budget forward estimates largely reflects a projected increase in receipts contingent on an early and sustained return to above trend economic growth. The PBO's latest medium term projections report highlights some of the risks to the budget projections. The 2015-16 budget projections assume that labour productivity will achieve its long-term average growth rate over the projection period and that the terms of trade will stabilise well above its long-run historical level. Both of these assumptions are subject to risk. The budget projections also show a steady deterioration in the underlying cash balance after 2021 reflecting a small but sustained increase in payments over the last four years of the projection period. This projected deterioration points to an underlying structural imbalance in the budget over the medium term. So the PBO will continue to prepare detailed 10-year budget projections after each, budget, uh, each annual budget. We will also test the sensitivity of these projections to economic shocks to help identify the key risks to the government's budget position over the medium term. The question <coughs> arises, is the PBO achieving its objectives? In addressing this question, I will draw on stakeholder sentiment as expressed through the continuing demand for the PBO services, the findings of the Auditor General's June 2014 performance audit, comments from the Chair of the JCPAA, and the results of the PBO's 2015 stakeholder survey. <clears throat> as I have already mentioned, the PBO has experienced a strong and sustained demand from parliamentarians for its policy costing and budget analysis services. This reflects a large amount of repeat business and is an indicator of the continuing reliance parliamentarians are placing on the PBO as they develop their policies. In his performance audit, the Auditor General found that the PBO has made a significant contribution to levelling the playing field for all parliamentarians, and overall, the work of the PBO has contributed to greater transparency about the fiscal and budgetary framework, and has the potential to further increase this transparency over time. He also concluded that the PBO has effectively undertaken its statutory role and is already well regarded as an authoritative, trusted and independent source of budgetary and fiscal policy analysis. The chair of the JCPAA 
<coughs> in the committee's November 2014 report commented that the PBO quickly gained the confidence of parliamentarians as an independent, non-partisan source of expertise on the budget cycle, fiscal policy and policy costings. He also stated that the PBO is an important addition to our democratic arrangements and has made, already made, a significant contribution to transparency and accountability in the country's finances. Towards the end of 2014-15, <clears throat> we commissioned an independent research firm to conduct a survey of the PBO's key stakeholders, including parliamentarians and their staff, independent analysts and media representatives. A large majority of respondents to this survey indicated that they were satisfied with the work of the PBO and agreed that the PBO is non-partisan, independent, operates with integrity, improves the transparency of budget and fiscal policy settings, and helps to level the playing field for all parliamentarians. There was a strong level of satisfaction <coughs> with the quality of the PBO's policy costings, budget analyses, and research publications. Stakeholder satisfaction with the PBO's service delivery arrangements was also high. In particular, the professionalism, accessibility and helpfulness of staff were rated highly, as was the consistency of the information provided by the PBO. Stakeholders would, however, uh, li understandably like to see an improvement in the timeliness of the PBO's responses. This is a challenge for us and will require us to continue to build our data and model repositories, further invest in staff training and ensure the PBO is adequately resourced to cope with the sustained high demand for its services. Overall, the evidence suggests that the PBO is achieving its objectives of helping to level the playing field for all parliamentarians and enhancing the transparency and public understanding of the budget and fiscal policy settings. It also suggests <clears throat> that the PBO has been accepted as a credible, trusted, independent and non-partisan institution of the parliament and an important element of the Australian democratic process. That said, we must not become complacent, but continue to strive to improve the services that we provide to parliamentarians and strengthen our public education role. I just want to make a couple of final remarks in conclusion. By and large, <coughs> the work of the PBO is forward looking. The PBO does not have an audit role and the sometimes awarded label fiscal watchdog does not sit easily on the PBO's shoulders. The PBO is a facilitator of policy development across the political spectrum and an educator of parliamentarians and the general public about fiscal policy issues. The PBO deals in facts and objective analysis. PBO has a role in identifying issues that, at times, may be uncomfortable for governments or oppositions, but the PBO must at all times remain non-partisan and it must not take sides in policy debates. I trust <coughs> that this lecture that has gone slightly over time uh, has given you a richer appreciation of the role that the PBO plays in our democratic process. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Phil. I know so much more about the PBO now yeah. than I did before. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> don't worry, you've still left us a few, uh, few minutes for questions. Yeah. If you do have a question, I'd invite you to come to the microphone. 
but <coughs> let, if I could just say at the, at the beginning, I think it's a, an incredibly impressive achievement for, for, of the three years that you've been uh, in, uh, in uh, existence to have, have uh, achieved those results and to have instilled that confidence in the impartiality and the quality of your product from your uh, main customers. I, I had lots of questions, but I'm going to mm. defer to the floor because I can always ask you, you a, another time. But <laughs> first question, Ernst. Thank you for a very informative talk about your office. You've spoken about the strong and sustained demand, and you've given us some very impressive figures about that. I wonder whether you could tell us a little bit more about where that demand is coming from. Hmm. To, to what extent does it come, for example, from shadow ministers? To what extent does it come from backbenchers? <clears throat> Uh, to what extent does it come from non-government members? Uh, to what extent is it also used by government members of, of the parliament? In other words, can you give us a flavour of what kind of people are, in fact, using your service? Yes, I can, um, without <coughs> going into all of the detail and certainly not uh, divulging confidences, but um, the, the biggest demand, as I think you wouldn't be surprised to hear, <clears throat> comes from non-government parties, um, so heavy use by the, uh, the opposition, by the Greens. Uh, Use also, or demand also, from uh, crossbench members, uh, independents, um, and some um, uh, some uh, backbench government members. Uh, I don't think I've left anybody out. <laughs> I don't think there's anybody else to include. Um, <clears throat> so, obviously. Um, we are a resource which is quite, uh, is used very, uh, very uh, intensively by, by oppositions. This was the case <clears throat> in the lead up to the last election when the coalition in opposition um, had almost all of their policies costed uh, by the PBO. Um, while not yet disclosed, uh, I'd be surprised if that wasn't the case this time with the current uh, current opposition. So that's that's certainly the way it, it it has been working and how it's shaping up. Okay, let's go to the back of the room first, and then we'll come back to you at the front, sir. Mr. Bowen, I wanted to put a little hypothetical situation of someone appearing uh, on your doorstep wanting to have capital expenditure and not having thought about operating costs. For instance, computers in secondary schools or something of that <coughs> nature. What is the office able to do to nudge people closer to reality and in such a circumstance where the data about operating costs lie more with the states than with Commonwealth agencies, what are you able to do to uh, maximise the credibility of any estimates? Well, <clears throat> first I should say that, um, just to make it clear, the costings that we do are costings that, uh, of policies that would impact the Commonwealth budget, not state budgets. That's the first thing, just to be clear. Um, <clears throat> but of course, we're happy to draw data from uh, wherever we can find it to get the best uh, data to help us do our costings. What we do <clears throat> when we get a proposal is make sure, first of all, that it is fully and comprehensively specified by the parliamentarian giving us the proposal. So at times we will go back <clears throat> and ask the parliamentarian, uh, you know, have they thought about even simple things like when the policy would start from, 
uh, which groups would it apply to, which it wouldn't, uh, you know, eligibility issues, things of this nature. So that we've got a complete set of specifications that we can cost. Then we have to <clears throat> make our own assumptions and find our own data to actually undertake the costing. Um, if we were asked to cost a proposal to, uh, I think you talked about uh, install computers somewhere, we wouldn't simply look at the capital cost. I mean, it's obvious uh, they will be used uh, over a period of time. Um, we would do a life cycle costing uh, as it impacts the budget, uh, at least over the forward estimates. Yep. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you for your wonderful uh, speech, uh, Mr. Phil Bowen. Uh, I'm a former consultant at the World Bank specifically focusing on PBOs. So I'm as passionate about your institution as you are. <laughs> right. uh, my question is two part. It's about the longer term prospects of the PBO. Um, you said explicitly that the PBO doesn't do policy recommendations, so it doesn't mm. have that advisory role. Mm. Do you think that in Australia it could provide greater value to the public and to the budget process and to democracy if it did have a policy recommendation role in the longer term? And secondly, in the longer term, could the PBO here serve as a so policy recommendation yep. and, uh, as a mentor of sorts for countries in the region that might consider establishing PBOs going forward? So New Zealand or Fiji do not have these institutions. So perhaps your experience could be shared with <clears throat> hmm. That's uh, On your <clears throat> first question, um, my usual answer to a hypothetical question is to say I don't answer hypothetical questions, but um, I, look, <clears throat> the model that has been adopted for the Australian PBO is not dissimilar to models of many other uh, like organisations. And for example, the Congressional Budget Office in the US, which I have mentioned, uh, and you'd be familiar with, similarly does not provide policy uh, advice or recommendations. And the rationale basically is that to do so risks uh, or runs the risk of the organisation being seen to be supporting a particular political uh, slant. And uh, that would make, could make it difficult for the organisation to remain uh, non-partisan and to be seen to be non-partisan. So at this point in time, I wouldn't see us moving down that path, uh, even if, uh, uh, no, well, well, I wouldn't see it at this time. <clears throat> um, on the mentoring, uh, we already do. Uh, we. I'm a member of the OECD's uh, network of parliamentary budget officials and independent fiscal institutions. Is that the GNPBO you're No, to? that's the World Bank one. <laughs> the, and the World Bank one, but I, I, we have provided some assistance mm -hmm. uh, to the, the network you just referred to, which comes under the auspices of the World Bank yes, yes. and includes mainly uh, developing countries from memory, although Canada is, uh, is quite closely associated. Um, I'd be happy to talk with you further about that uh, outside, but, um, but we have provided some assistance in peer reviewing a set of principles that are being developed mm -hmm. um, from memory. I can't quite remember who was developing them now, but uh, for, that, for that group. Um, and um, and so we're and we're also open to doing more of that to help others. Now that we we are reasonably well established, although still quite young. Sure. Thank mm. you. Oh, yes, Scott, you can ask a question. <laughs> I won't be able to ask mine. You can ask. Yours. Sorry, Rachel. It's all right. Go, please go ahead. <laughs> Mine's just a very simple one. Do you have a relationship with the Parliamentary Library? Uh, yes, we do. Um, 
it's not a, a formal relationship, but some of the best relationships are informal. And um, <clears throat> we, um, we recently, uh, I think it was earlier this week, in fact, uh, had a seminar presented by senior people from the Parliamentary Library to staff of the PBO. And we do look at ways in which we can cooperate. Uh, we, that said, <clears throat> we have distinct um, roles and responsibilities uh, and mandates. But yes, we, we have a very cooperative uh, arrangement. Yeah. You might recall that before the PBO was established, the, the library did get some extra funding to um, have a, a capacity for more economic advice and, and <clears throat> perhaps some um, costings. But of course, once the PBO was established, the, um, the, the, that, that funding I don't think continued. Oh. So. Um, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Oh, well. <laughs> but my, my question is very quick <laughs> and, and um, <laughs> You can give it a, a superficial answer, but I, I was just really interested in your educative function mm. and what thoughts you've given to how you measure your impact on the mm. capacity of mm. parliamentarians to use that enhanced fiscal and economic literacy in their um, in, the, in the performance of their roles, for example, you know, through their questions at estimates committees and, and such like. Is there any formal mm. monitoring or mm. evaluation of that yet, or is it mm. too early, do you think? Um, well, <clears throat> measuring outcomes uh, is difficult at the best of times. Um, at this point, we are attempting to measure perhaps the next step down, the, the outputs that we uh, deliver. Uh, we are doing that in a couple of ways. <clears throat> One, we do monitor the, the, the hits we get to our web page and the documents that are reviewed. Um, we also monitor <clears throat> articles in the, in the press uh, that uh, draw on our work, whether it's our published work or policy costings. And <clears throat> thirdly, we, as I mentioned before, uh, have conducted one, or our first stakeholder survey. Um, and probably, you know, this is really important to get feedback from the people who we work with, uh, who use our products. And it's not perfect, but it's you know, one of the better mm -hmm. indicators that we've got at this time of how well our work is being received and how helpful it is. I'm not sure that we would ever get to the point of, of uh, attempting to attribute a higher quality debate on fiscal policy to the PBO's work, there, there is always a difficulty in a attribution mm. of any such outcome. Mm. But um, of course, we'd be very happy to see it. Yes. Mm. Well, sadly, our time is <clears throat> up and I apologise to you all for, for us going slightly over. But um, that was a terrific lecture, Phil. I, I, I think it was um, excellent expose of the work of the PBO and it, it's um, the, the way that it has uh, jumped into a, a role that, that is, was obviously there to be, to be filled. Mm. So well mm. done and uh, please join me in thanking Phil Bowen today. Thank you.